My name is Peter Fleming, and I'm uh, chairman of this session, and it's my uh, very pleasant uh, role to introduce the plenary speaker this morning. He's Professor Alexander Kuzhansky. I'll give you a little bit of uh, an introduction to him and uh, tell you a little of his background. He completed his undergraduate studies in electrical engineering at the Technical University of Ural and in mathematics, uh, including graduate studies at the University of Ural also. This was at uh, Yekaterinburg. He received his, the equivalent of a PhD and his habilitation doctorate from the University of Ural, where he became full professor. And from 1967 to 1984, he worked at the Institute of Mathematics and Mechanics at the Ural branch of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR as senior researcher, head of department, and director. And from 1984 to 1992, Professor Kuzhansky was the chairman of the Systems and Decision Sciences Program, and since 1987, also deputy director of IASA, the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis, which is located in Luxembourg, Austria, the home of uh, the IFAC Secretariat. From 1992 until today, and continuing. He's organizer and head of department of systems analysis at the Moscow State University at Lomonosov. In the faculty of computational mathematics and cybernetics, he's distinguished professor, and since 1998, he's also been a visiting research scholar at the University of California at Berkeley. He was elected associate member of the um, Russian former Soviet Academy of Sciences in 1981 and full member in 1990, and he's chairman of the Russian National uh, Committee for Automatic Control, the IFAC NMO. He's main, made many valuable contributions to IFAC and has just uh, recently finished uh, serving on council. In a very distinguished career, he uh, has been uh, recognized as a fellow of IFAC. He was the recipient of the top scientific award of the Soviet Union, a remarkable achievement. And he's honorary scholar of the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis, at, uh, that is IASA. His research interests are wide and varied and include uh, the field of estimation and control under incomplete realistic information, the closed loop control of complex systems. But I think that's a sufficient introduction for our distinguished speaker this morning. And I'd like to introduce Professor Kozhansky to you, who will uh, give us a lecture on closed loop control under realistic information. Thank you, Professor Fleming. Well, <coughs> I want to start my lecture with uh, acknowledgments and, and wish to thank the organizers of the program committee, professors Isidori Bitanti in Moscow for inviting me here to give this lecture in this historical city where you can still feel the aura from the great scientific minds of humankind. Yes. So, uh, so, uh, the topic of my uh, lecture is uh, feedback control and uh, realistic information. And these are the items which will be there and now. What are the motivations for this? So, <clears throat> the role of feedback, uh, we know very well that suppose if we, we are at a certain point and there is a flow and this is a river and we want to reach the red one, and then we can find the reachability set. And that's all that what we can predict. But if we can measure something online several times, then we can reduce this domain to something. And feedback is a crucial point in navigation and control and in motion planning. So we would like to treat control and uh, uncertainty, and output feedback control, and the various types of noise. Yes. And also, we are interested not only in speaking about that, but also in speaking of the calculations, how to calculate. This is one of the difficulties which sometimes stops people from going on. And this is a 
backward reachability sets, which will be further calculated for <coughs> systems of large dimensions. Yes, no, the next one. And also, uh, this is a flexible structure which can be approximated by system of large dimensions. Next one, yes. Next one, yes. And uh, then a couple of uh, complex uh, systems. One is uh, unmanned control of a group of, of uh, agents. And uh, uh, the next one. The other, our aspiration, what is team control, how to coordinate, how to use these techniques for such problems. And, then, uh, and the other one is uh, traffic control, because the plague of the 21st century are traffic jams all over the world. Yes, so this is also a complex system. Yes. <coughs> and also nonlinearity and non-convexity uh, among the problems which we have, we have to treat them then. And these are special types of control. We have to look for new classes of control inputs which could solve uh, control problems in minimal time. Yes. So, feedback control, as far as you know, was started quite long ago, and the first mathematical models belong to Maxwell and Vishnigradsky. Uh, and then the theory of automatic control systems were quite well developed already until the 30s, where you had all this basic theories, uh, transfer functions, Laplace and mean, Nyquist criteria, and so on. But the development of optimal control was uh, such that it's considered an optimization problem as the basic tool. And therefore, the precursors were those who developed the calculus of variations, starting from Erwin Lagrange, Legendre, and Hamilton Jacobi, and up to the 20th century. And we know that in mechanics, starting from the famous book by Lagrange, and there are two basic problems. One, the first problem of dynamics is, given the forces, find the motion. This is a direct problem. And the second one is, given the motion, find the forces, which is the problem of observability identification. And uh, this is an inverse problem. So everything that deals with observers, identification, are inverse problems whose property, the most difficult property, is that they are lead to unstable numerical solutions which have to be treated in a special way. So, a few minutes about the origins. So the optimal control problem was formulated in the 50s, and it led to Pantragin's maximum principle, a two-point boundary value problem for first-order ODEs, and also, at the, about the same time, appeared the hamilton jacobi version for control, which is attributed to Richard Bellman, in some sense also to Rufus Isaacs. And this is a first order PD. So the first one deals with open loop control, where we have a control program. The other one with feedback control, UFTX. And one of the key problems and techniques as a tool which we, use, we will use the calculation of reachability sets. The reachability set is the set of all points which can be reached from the starting point using all the possible controls. So we have a tube of solutions and we will use this tube approach. And then the cross sections of such tubes will be the reachability sets. But what is more realistic is not to find where we can come at a fixed time, but where we can come at a given interval of time between so-and-so. This is more often. But in, even in the simple case, when the cross-sections are convex, the union of these sets already is non-convex, so treating non-convexity is one of the key issues here. So the forward reachability set, the attainability domain, is the union of all such trajectories, as we can see over all possible controls. And we have a backward reachability set, which is the union of all vectors from which the set, the target set may be reached by some control. Without disturbances, the reachability set for open loop controls and for closed loop controls is the same. If there are disturbances, they are not the same, of course. And uh, similar relations 
hold for reachability at some time within an interval, and the backward reachability set for reachability at some time. So what is the scheme? I will show the scheme and mention it for the simplest problems, and then I don't want to overload the audience with mathematics. I will just show pictures and solutions to more complicated problems which I achieved through a generalization of the elementary scheme and, and propagation and innovation. Uh, and this is a mathematical tool which can be read from uh, literature. Yeah. So suppose we have a starting set X and a certain point X here. Will X belong to the reachability set? So we have to solve a control problem, minimizing the distance of the starting point from here. And if the distance is zero, then X belongs to the reachability set. If the distance is not zero, it does not belong to the reachability set. So we need to study such a value function, such an optimization problem. And if we have the value function is here, then it's cross-section. It's the set of points where the value function is equal to zero. So we have to calculate value functions and then taking their cross sections, which was in blue, uh, we get the result. So there is a dual way of looking at things. Either you use set value things and find sets, or you use functions and their cross sections. And for these functions, it's more likely to write down an evolution equation because the theory of PDEs is very well developed. Well, in contrast with set value tubes where the evolution equation is not uh, very well defined still. So, yes. so the tube X satisfies uh, an inequality. So, and we just have to check the set of points when V is equal to zero. And if something here, you have an epsilon that's with the neighborhood. Actually, you never find the exact set. You always calculate it with some error, and therefore you have to calculate the neighborhoods, and you need to find a function, uh, such an inequality. And if we have such a function, in order to deal with the feedback control, we have to check the principle of optimality, which means if you have a reachability set at the starting point, and you want to have the solution at the end point, it is the same as finding the reachability set to an, at an intermediate point and then take them uh, uh, to the same final time. Must, and this must give the same result. This is a dynamic programming equation, a PDE of the hamilton jacobi bellman type, and the neighborhood satisfies such an inequality. Yes. And the same thing for the backward reachability sets. So this allows to uh, develop two types of dynamic programming equation, one under some boundary conditions. One is the forward equation with boundary condition on the left. And this will give us the reachability, the forward reachability set. The other is the backward equation with boundary at the end. And this cross-section of this value function will give you the backward reachability set. In all the courses on dynamic programming, the problem which was usually studied was the second one. And the forward was not studied that much. Although we always have to consider such a pair and see how they behave. But here, a main difficulty arose, because if you take problems generated by technical applications, the function V will not be differentiable, and therefore you could not apply. You cannot apply classical theory of PDEs. But there was a huge activity on non-differentiable optimization, and then generalized solutions were invented, and so on. So the point is that we will use the hamilton jacobi bellman equation but to understand the problem, but that doesn't mean that we will solve it by using it. We can use it by solving other methods and bypassing the maybe sometimes difficult problem of integrating them. But to understand this, it's very important to understand what is the real uh, position of the system. Yes. So finding these sets is not an optimization problem, but we may solve it using optimization technique. And the scheme is formulate an optimization problem 
define the value function, check the principal optimality, find the AGB equation, and then and then look how to uh, then look at the problem and think how to solve it with other means. Yes. And then uh, in dynamic program we calculate the control from this equation. But we must always remember one thing which the engineers usually do not check, that this function which we find must satisfy the equation in some reasonable sense. And there are many, many difficulties, and of course it's more, there's a temptation to explain everything only to the street time systems without having any mathematical trouble. But if you have large scale uh, discrete time systems, then the, the formula is so cumbersome, maybe important, that you won't see the idea, you don't feel the melody. So you have to use the continuous model to understand what depends on what, and then decide how to calculate it, by discretization or not. And the problem is what to discretize, the continuous solution or the setting of the problem from the beginning. And this gives various results, yes. So, in the, in the classical sense, instead of solving the hamilton chipkov equation, we use Krasovsky's aiming rule. So we find the distance from the reachability, backward reachability tube, and find the control which gives us. So this is similar to control the upon functions because we have to find the total derivative of a function, which is the, how the, the distance to the reach set. And, and then find this, uh, solve this inequality. So, but if we have feedback, then uh, we need to measure something. And the precursors of the measurement theory was called the mogorov wiener filtering theory, and the new vision triggered by Kalman. What happened here? Uh, measurement equation was introduced, the notions of controllability and observability, an equation of the observer, and the analytical controller design, and a lot of topics in stochastic control, which I will not mention. I will speak of more generalized schemes. Yes. So the innovative issues, the realistic issues, they require to look at the innovations in the system model, in the measurement model, we have to cope with uncertainty, various types of uncertainty, treat complex constraints, and then model the communication scheme, especially using modern technology, and then see how this can be applied to complex systems. So the basic problem which we treat will consider this system, with, and many of the results can be generalized to a huge array of situations, and I will not mention all of them, but just the idea. So suppose we have such an equation. This is a control, this is a disturbance. So everything that is in, in blue is known. This is you, this is the measurement, and what is red is unknown, and the uh, errors are taken to be unknown but bounded. And we have to steer the system from starting point to a target point. And if in the classical point u depends on t and x, so then when we do not know anything, what should substitute for x? It must be something that can be measured and something that can ensure the principle of optimality. And that's why you need the hamilton jacobi vision, at least, to properly define the position of the system. So what is the crucial variable which has to be used? In stochastic control, this is sufficient statistics for seeing. Here, it is something that we have to define. And it may happen that that uh, the models may also may not be known exactly. They may be known exactly or inaccurately. Uh, so, What's the difference? We often feel, we know that some people are dealing with robust control and other people are dealing with differential games. And these are two different communities which only partially overlap here at IFAX. So what's the difference between differential games and uh, using differential games and uh, robust control? Here and there you use minimax properties. 
So in robust control, you emphasize a guaranteed result. In differential games, you emphasize the search for saddle points, which in robust control are not the center of attention. And there are, there are two books, seminal books here, one was by Krasovsky, Subotin, Springer, Verlag, and the other is by Bazar and Bernard on H infinity control and related minimax problems. So, measurements and centers, we will, can use various types of sensors. You see now, the investigation of observers is at the heart of control theory, because how to control systems and the complete information is very well known. But for each new class of complex problems, you have to introduce new types of observers. And you have to understand how to use these observers to solve this or that control problem. And for this, you need various types of measurements, including mo uh, models of wireless, of networks, and various types, including random, modeling of random signals and deterministic, and so on. So, in this uh, lecture, we'll use the classical measurement equation, which should also be point-wise. This is uh, control of highways. The first is control of motion. It can be integrated in time for average in space for the heat equation, distributed and various type coordinated networks of different physical nature. For example, the measurement uh, in biomedical models and one of the interesting new types of sensors are moving sensors, the sensors which track the coordinate scanning sensors. And they allow to highly improve observability properties by introducing moving sensors. So what type of solutions do we want? We want to find a tube and to learn how to control this tube to reach the target set. Yes. And we need solutions that cope with different types of noise. Maybe stochastic, Gaussian, unstructured noise, or their combinations. And all of them must be treated by the scheme. Yes. So in many systems, a part can be treated as the one which has stochastic noise, the classical type, and the other may have to be treated as a system with unknown but bounded noise. What are the difficulties? Some difficulties, of course, these are nonlinearity and nonconvexity, the enlarged dimensions, and especially finite horizon. 90% of the problems which we have are stabilization, stabilization, stabilization. You want to stabilize this or that, everything. You cannot solve all the problems only by knowing how to stabilize and to use the Pinot function to that, because if you have navigations, say, among the rocks and the towers, you won't, you won't need a stabilization. You need to track the, the whole trajectory and understand how to do it and have finite observers. And this is a far more difficult problem, which anyway does arise in spending, and you cannot do everything only through regulation. Regulation is a key point and it uh, has to be done, but the 21st century brings us a whole array. Everything will be automated now, and you have to find the ways of approaching these problems. Uh, so the issues are uh, how to understand, for this we use AJB, how to solve, what to discretize. For example, uh, Jerry Martin has a whole theory of interpreting all the whole theory of mechanics through discrete time, the variational principle, everything, is also one of the approaches. And then how to calculate, how to solve the problem to the end. So this is the scheme of using various approaches for linear systems and convex analysis, and, and for these, it's something else. Yeah. So in the realistic sense, we have to define a generalized state, and, and then work in the space of generalized states and analyze the possibility of solving these problems in the, set of, in the setting and then find the control as a function of the generalized state. You can find it from direct solution if this is available. If not, you use other tools, which the, there is an abundant array of tools which can be well used. So the, the perfect state be feedback, we have u of t x in output feedback, we have u of t something. This is the new state. 
So we either memorize the measurements, like this is done in the common filter, or find a set of states which are consistent with the measurements and constraints on the uncertain items, and then we have information tubes. So this may be a state, or this may be a value function which is achieved the way I mentioned before, and then its cross-section will be this. And this, then this is the Hamilton Jacob equation. So the art is to find the proper generalized state for each problem with realistic information. And under realistic information, what must you know? What minimum must, must you know? So that the generalized optimality principle is true. Because we are not just solving the problem of finding the length of a, of a rod of just one number or something like that. We want to find an estimate which evolves in time, tracking a complex system with all its peculiarities and certain disturbances and that. So if Galileo would live now, and not, not, not uh, uh, now, he would have to treat this problem and not only the pendulum and the cathedral of Pisa. Yes. So we have such a problem now, and uh, we have to find the problem of dealing with this information state. And this approach was developed in the papers by Barris and James, and our paper with, with John Barris and, uh, and it was realized how to, at an IFAC, one of the IFAC Nolcos symposiums, and, and I will tell you what, how this is done later. So we have to specify a feedback where the control depends on the generalized state, which may be a set. So if you deal with tubes, it depends on the cross-section of this tube. And now, of course, we have to control the evolution of a system described by trajectory tubes. These are calculated through guaranteed estimation. And Investigation observers is now at the heart of feedback control. We have works, recent works, also represented in this Congress by Arthur Grand, by Isidori and his colleagues, by Pali, as we heard yesterday, and so on. So, uh, a few words about. Uh, how many minutes? A few words about uh, such estimation. So, each estimation gives you a square, and C is the noise, and depending on the noise, the squares overlap each other. They may overlap in such a way that there's no innovation of information, and that's the worst case, but they may also overlap in such a way that you have the exact solution. So, if the noise is not stochastic, there is a best case and a worst case. So you must always figure out what is the worst case noise and what is the best case noise. If you can influence the error, the noise, then you can try to make it closer to the best case if you want to help the observer. If you want to harm the observer, you will see that the noise is the worst case. Uh, please, less. But there are difficulties. Suppose we have a nonlinear system and the reachability set is uh, these leaves which we have here. And if we measure the angle, we will see that in the nonlinear case, the position, the consistency set, and the information tube is a disconnected set. And now suppose you want to bring a system by controlling a remote control and observations, you want to let it go through this door. You see? And suppose you have a table, and you want to take this table through this door. So if you take the non-convex set, and you bring the table out here, you will be able. But if you take its convex hull, as is usually done, you won't get, get far, because you won't, the convex hull is there. So you have to track, figure out the non-convex configurations of the motions, when you, which you control five times, so you could navigate the system in a complex environment and complex uh, uh, obstacles. Yes. 
Uh, so the measurement is such that we take the reachability set and we intersect it with the measurement and we go further and further and then get the information set. But what is a general nonlinear system? Some people say, I deal with nonlinear systems. What's a linear system? Reasonable attitude is to say that we deal with a certain class of nonlinear systems. And here's an example of a nonlinear system, which is a superposition of three mappings. Uh, these are the formula. So at first we have a set. The first mapping brings us to such a set. The third map mapping brings us to such a set, and so on. So if we have two adjacent points here, then after an measurement, after some steps, we will have the next picture. We start with the initial set. That's what we know at the beginning. Then this is a nonlinear system, and this set turns into another one. And where the, po the points which were closed, they may be now far apart, and this is the measurement. So the brown regions are what remains after the measurement. And now, one more step, and we have more. One more step, and we have still more. One more step, and we have still more. So after a finite number of steps, the two points which were very close at the beginning, they may be far apart. So it's a very unstable a situation, especially when you deal with nonlinear systems and you have to figure out and how to treat such observations or change the types of sensors because such a sensor gives you such... So even a small deviation at the initial point can lead to very large discrepancies in the final estimate. And this has to be realized because there was a lot of trouble due to the lack of understanding. And the second thing is differentiating the measurements should be forbidden. Sometimes there are mappings, you take the signal, you differentiate it at times, and you get a, a mapping, and then you study whether it is injective or subjective. But differentiation should be forbidden because numerically, Finding one problem is already a very unstable calculation, not to men all the more calculating the other higher derivatives with errors. So when the first quadratic uh, controllers were used, people tried to actually substitute the lack of information by differentiating the signal and putting it into the system, and it led to a whole array of crashes of the, of the real systems. Yes. So we have disturbances which are unknown but bounded, with no statistics, with bounds given. Uh, the measurements may be at discrete time or they may be random. And we estimate the set valued solutions. And each realization arrives uh, in the general case. It has a worst case and uh, best case. If it is random, then each realization arrives with probability zero, and there are no best or worst cases. And now what to do if the noise is unknown but bound? And the bound is not known. What to do? Then we introduce a measure of uncertainty. Well, let us take the norm. This is the norm of the uncertainties. And we want to estimate the output. And then we find the deviation of the estimator from the output and take the maximum over the disturbances and the minimum over the potential estimates and find this number. And the best you can find is the coefficient of proportionality between the input and the output. So the more the input, the more the output. And this is the coefficients which you have from the H-infinity approach. So if we deal with an H-infinity equations of what equations the way I said, you have actually the same uh, hamilton jacobi equation. But you just use it in another way. And these are the instances of time and discrete observations. Yes. 
No. Next. And such is the system. And there are conditions for the information uh, tube. Right. So that is such a condition. You see that, as usually in the Kalman filter, but now even in the nonlinear case, under some assumptions on the right hand side, which you can find in, in the papers mentioned here, you have an additional term, which is a deviation from this. And this is the place where the error should stay, and, and this is uh, uh, to be here. The error in the right hand side is in the set by the right hand side, and here is the coefficient which you have to find. And then the set which you want to find in the nonlinear case is just an intersection of such reachability sets over all coefficients. And these. And these may depend on Tx, or they may depend only on T, or they may be constant. And depending on that, we have a more or less accurate estimate here. And now, uh, wait. Now for the linear case, next, next slide. So actually what we have, so we have, this is the convex skull of the estimator for the nonlinear systems. And this is an intersection of ellipsoids or other types of sets. So me, this immediately indicates that there's a demand for parallel calculations or distributed calculations. Or each measurement was made at other points, and we take them and coordinate them together. And the more processors we have, the better is the estimate. And such experiments, and then this is the future. Of course, now in an embedded system, you may not be able to introduce parallel calculations, but I remember what computers we used years ago and what we could solve then, what we can, I can, solve, now, I can solve now and in some not very distant time. Uh, great things could be made. Now. now, if the system is linear, we have such an estimator. Now, this is a set. This is the bound on the unknown disturbance in the input. This is the bound on the disturbance in the measurement. And this is L of T. So if we take the intersection over all Ls, we'll have the exact solution. And, and this requires a parallel calculations. Yes. And we have an equality. So if green is the reachability sets without measurement, red is the measurement, and then we have a sort of approximations of this, which is the true reachability sets. Go on. And this way we get it. And it doesn't take more time. If you have several processors, they do this simultaneously. You just coordinate them. Go on. Yes. Now, what about the common filter? It's not only useful. It's useful not only for stochastic control of linear systems. Why? Because among the sets which approximate the observer here, we use ellipsoids. But look at the equations of the Kalman filter. They actually give you an ellipsoid. They give you a center and a matrix, which is normalized in different ways. If you want a stochastic control, you can calculate confidence domains and probability like it is done classically. If you want a deterministic estimate, you use it. So instead of the function L, which I had, you can use the function P from the common equations and change all the variances. You have for each collection of variances, which is a very subjective estimate, and common indicates that. And here, you just take the intersection of the, all the possible variances of the common equation, then you will have the deterministic estimate. So the abundant software for calculating Riccati equations can be used here for much more complicated problems and for other classes of noise than are usually presupposed to be in the system, yes. Well, and then we control uh, we control the system uh, this way. So further on, this is a generalization of the classical approach to systems with disturbances in the inputs and outputs. We have both nonlinear solutions and linear 
So I will indicate uh, uh, some examples. Now I will skip uh, the theory of how to solve it because I don't want to overload you with mathematics, but I will rather show pictures of what types of problems were solved. So now pass to output feedback control. Go on, go on. Oh, oh the previous one, yes. Previous, no, the previous slide. Vernice is, yeah. No, the text, the te yeah, yeah. So do not discard the AGB approach because it allows us to understand how the solution should be looked for, what is the position, what should be the structure of the feedback. I want to mention that I'm speaking of more complicated problems than just adaptive problems of stabilizing something by tracking one number, two numbers, or tuning, or so. No, these are complicated problems of maneuvering and among the, say, towers of oil, well, of, of uh, oil uh, and oil industry, or investigating the depths of the ocean with simultaneous measurements and other complicated. Uh, uh, but there is a very good activity here on using level set methods and pass marching methods by Setiano Shepetki, and there's a toolbox by Ian Mitchell, who was a postdoc at Stanford and Berkeley. We have a joint paper now. He is in Vancouver, Canada. And on. so we will indicate solution scheme for the linear convex case. I will skip this, and then we will indicate calculation schemes and consider nonlinearity and uncertainty. Now, please jump further, further, further. This is good. So this is the approach now. Uh, you see, in the classical situation, we found the control from calculating this distance, as I mentioned, and having the value function and doing that, next one. But if we have uncertainty, then instead of a point, we have a set, and we have to do the same, but calculating the distance of this set from a similar W. You may think that you will now need to have the W in the set of sets, but this is not true because you can use the sets for a system with complete information for the backward set and work with the state which is from incomplete information. And this is the basic theorem which allows to approach complicated problems with such techniques. And so this is the type of control. We find such distances and find the U of Tx. And, go on. Go on, go on. and that's what we do in the case of realistic control. In the case of realistic control, we don't have a point. We have a set. And one of the very important points in observation is not only to find a point, which is a beautiful mathematical problem and, and great people are able to solve it, but you must always find the error limits and you have to be able to estimate the errors. If you produce a point, you must always indicate what type of error and what is the size of the error which accompanies this point. And you will always have these errors because even in the most precisely solved problem, you will have to solve it with a computer and there will be errors in the calculations. So you have to do that. So you always have to, if you have a point, you must always have an error set and figure out. And so all numerical mathematics should be changed for considering such things. Then you will have the jamming of the algorithms. No. Uh, and so we can find evolution equations for incomplete information, which can be described uh, through analytical equations. All right. All right. So now we can consider, I want to show some pictures on uh, 
control with incomplete information. Now the crucial point is we have unstructured uncertainty is that the easier case is when the control and the unknown inputs, they satisfy matching conditions, so they are of similar types. So this is an example when there are no matching conditions and when the errors and the control are not of the same range. And so we can measure either the first position, either X, the position, or the velocity, or both. And we have a noise, a known system input noise model as uh, uniformly distributed in a circle, or as a bang-bang noise, or as the worst case. So let us look at the pictures. So we have here, we have a target control problem. So the blue tube is when we measure the position of the system. The large green one is when we measure only the velocity. And the smaller tube inside with dark green is when we measure both. There is a large accuracy. And since we have a system of here of dimension four, we can have six projections. And this is a full picture of a four-dimensional space. We can look at the large dimensional spaces through various projections of these. And now, uh, come to the next picture. Next. So now we will measure only the position x of the system. So, and then we have a tube. If the noise is random, we have the tube of the blue type. If the noise is a bang bang, but we do not know the, we only know the amplitude and nothing else. And then it is the dark green inside. And the largest tube is the worst case. What is the worst case? The worst case if the noise does not exist is equal to zero, but we do not know that. So when you see a person who is very silent, you don't know what he really thinks. If you see a very nervous problem, you figure out what he wants, what he does not like. So the same thing happens here. The worst case is when the error is zero, but we do not know that. We presume that is somewhere among this range. And we have to understand how to figure out what really happens in the system. And here we also have uh, such positions. Now, if the system is linear, it can be separated into parts, yes, please. into the part of the green, which is a pure system of control with no errors, no unknown inputs, and the information tube, which we calculate in addition. So we have a control problem and a tube, which we can only estimate. And what is the result? The result is the sum of two vectors. The sum of the green vector and the blue one must belong to the target set. So we can separate the calculations of tubes from the control. And for the control, we use the techniques which are very well developed. Good. All right. Yes. So these are various uh, cases here. So we need now to calculate. We want to pr solve the problem to the end. What does that mean? That we must have the theory, we must find the algorithms, we must develop the software, and all this must happen together. So we use various types of techniques, which are indicated here. And we need effective calculation for large dimensions. And this can be reached through ellipsoidal calculus and polyhedral methods, and implemented through parallel calculations allowing high dimensions, and so on. So we have ellipsoidal approximations. Next. Next, 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 next. So we approximate the reachability set by ellipsoids, or like that. And we have also internal approximations. Or in three dimensions, it looks like that. And, and this is the reachability tube. We have an internal approximation and an external. And the ellipsoids are parameterized. The more ellipsoids we have, the more accurate it is. Uh, 
approximation. We have an internet row, so it will get absolutely correct, so we can figure out what we need depending on one accuracy we need. And the main point is that also internal approximations, made because to internal approximation in the set is much more difficult than external. <coughs> Go on. Next one. So show, let it move. So this is a two-dimensional projection of such approximations. The next one. Next one. On, we have four coordinates and we take 3D approximations and we have the picture of motion in the large dimensional spaces. And we can look at it. Now, uh, let's go on to the next one. Yes. So, next. And now we have the forward and backward reachability sets. Now, suppose we have a point and a target set. And we want to find the control which leads us. Wait. Wait, wait, please. I did not explain. So, if we want to go from the left point, we have a blue tube. And if we want to reach the right point, we look at the reachability sets from the left point and the backward reachability set from the right point. And now, if the solution exists, they must have an intersection. And then we do not need to calculate the controls to find the trajectory. And now, please. So look how it goes. If we properly calculate, we can always find this is the method of colliding cubes. The tubes collide, and we can find the various situations. We can figure out the dynamics by colliding the tubes. Yes. Next one. So there are books on uh, ellipsoidal calculus, which was used, and a toolbox which was downloaded in 77 countries with thousands of downloads, which means it, this, these things are needed by people. And also everywhere, in NASA, in Russia, in uh, Germany, even in Nepal. In Nepal, probably some people came for holidays, but in spare time, they were doing their PhDs. That's why I think why in Nepal they used ellipsoidal calculus. Yeah. In, they were climbing, between climbing the mountains they used it, yes. Now, next one. And we also said parallel to this, the same ideology is used for polyhedral approximation by doing this with boxes. And this belongs to Elena Costa-Uso in the Institute of Mathematics and Mechanics, who did a very nice, very, very nice work, yes. And these are the tubes which are box valued. So for more complicated things, we can combine ellipsoids with boxes and have very tight approximations. And we should not be afraid, you know, of using these techniques. Go on. So go on, yes. So these are various types of box valued approximations. Now look, suppose we want to approximate the, the green set from inside, right? And then, if we have polyhedral approximations, it's red. But if we have ellipsoidal arcs, it is more accurate. But of course, if the green set has a flat, uh, flat situation, some part is just a flat line, then we combine both and we have accurate things. Uh, and now, go on. And so now, we have an oscillating system of equations. And we have uh, matching, no matching conditions to control. And now we'll approximate a string, a flexible string by a sequence of ellipsoid, of uh, uh, oscillating. It's all right, thank you. Go on, go on, go on. Go on. So now we have 50 elements and a heterogeneous string. So, 100 ordinary differential equations. And we stabilize this in finite time. Next. Now, 200 ordinary uh, equations. So, 100 springs. And we stabilize this. Now, the next one. Now we have a whole spring 
the order is 500 ordinary differential equations and it's with full control. So now we do not notice that this is a discrete system because our eye, like in the cinema, allows us to see flexible structures moving, though we solve discrete problems just using ordinary differential equations. Now let's go on. Uh, go on. Uh, now I have very little time left. I'll show some pictures of a uh, cyber physical system which is controlling a group of uh, agents. Go on. So a group of agents is a team if it is working without collisions and if it is structured inside a container. Here it is. Go on. Go on, go on. And so what we do, if we have to move the team from here to here, the motivation is extinguishing fires with unmanned, uh, actually, we could also study the ocean or many other things. So go on. And, and then we solve an array of uh, mathematical problems. Go on. Go on. So controlling ellipsoidal valued motions, set valued trajectories, flocking to a team, dynamic programming for team control, feedback, and synchronization. Go on. Uh, next one. Next one. Now, this one. Now, so we have a team here, and these are the obstacles. Look what kind of motions we have. We have to restructure them inside the virtual container, and this virtual container leads them through the obstacles. And they must reconfigure the whole system and again to be collected inside a circle. Now look how this is. And these are Newtonian motions. These are not just simple motions in kinematics. These are motions with full dynamics with uh, interaction, the measurements, and all that. So it's a whole cyber physical complex system because you have a combination of motion, of obstacle problems, of communication signals and so on to solve this. Now, please go further. Go on. No, the last one. Last one. Further. 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 Uh -huh. Now, suppose we have two ellipsoids. We first have to solve a problem of controlling ellipsoidal motions. Go on. Show the picture. No, no. Return that. So first, the motions of ellipsoids. So we have to learn how to do that. And these are virtual motions. They can be solved offline. So that's how the ellipsoidal tubes go, and they, they, they come in here. No, just a minute. Two pictures. Now, next one. Now they're full of agents. We have 12 agents a group. We have to control such a group. Go on. And that's how they go there. But what is a virtual container? It's a container which we do not see. It exists only in the program. And now take the next one. And that's what we really see. We don't see the ellipsoids, but what we will actually see is such a thing, but it is solved through such combinations. All right. Thank you. If I have two minutes, I will just show one picture about traffic jams. Now, go on, next one. So, no, and this was, the motivation comes from underwater in the Institute of uh, Mar Mar uh, Marine Studies in Vladivostok with uh, uh, Professor Kisilov being the uh, PI. You have such, uh, many of such programs in the United States. You have a NATO program. I just wanted to say that in Russia there also is a problem for unmanned and underwater things. And they study volcanoes and uh, bottom. This is on the Pacific coast and they study the, the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, and they, it's very important to measure things at the same time they need to communicate and so on. Go on. So there are formations here, go on, yes, go on, yes, and a communication scheme. Next. Go on. So now a few minutes, if, if 
our chairman, I will take three minutes. So traffic jams. This is a traffic jam in the on Friday evening on the Garden Ring in Moscow, a traffic jam. I happen to drive here. Next one. This is in Los Angeles throughout the whole day, a highway where is such a situation. I also happened to drive there too, and it wasn't that jam. Next one. And this was in August in Peking. There was a huge traffic jam in Peking. And they also had a, a situation. With it. So something has to be done here. And so, the, the, and this is also a cyber physical system. How to control all this and what to measure. So, so for traffic control, we have a cell transmission model, model which is a hybrid system because, come on. So there is a, each part of the highway has a diagram. So when it is, has a free load, it goes there. So you have the density, which is the number of cars per unit of space. And you have the flow, which is the number of units of time. And this is the linear function. And so the actual system switches from the, this part of the model to this part of the model. And we have to deal with that. Please, and now the last shape. So that's what we measure. We have to measure the flow, yes, and we need the density, but we cannot measure the density. We can only measure the speed. And so we have to solve a nonlinear observability problem, the type of problems which yesterday Professor Preli was telling us. But now, if Galileo would be here, he would, instead of the pendulum, he would have to solve these problems. And they are even of same complexity, or even maybe more. And the next picture. And, and then we have uncertainty in this model. We treat it the way we have. That's the next one. And look, we have the same type of measurements of the traffic flow. This is the same picture as it was in the theory which, of observations which I mentioned. So it's exactly, precisely used here. And this information is sent to the next row, the last, last slide, to a controller. And this controller must coordinate as soon as this is a model predictive system with some feedback. And if we predict that there will be a jam, we start sending the signals to the ongoing ramps and using the traffic lights to, to stop the flows, or giving signs indicating the drivers what to do. So I will finish my thing, and now I would like to show some acknowledgments to those who helped in this. So first of all, the people who influenced my research, this is my tutor and teacher, Professor Krasovsky. On, uh, one week from now, he will, his, he will have his 87th birthday. And we were also very much in, influenced by the work of Pantragin, our generation. And also I was very much interest, influenced by the work of Kalman because uh, Krasovsky gave me the early works of Kalman and the whole idea of how to create feed loop uh, uh, feedback solutions, closed loop solutions came from Kalman's work. And this is Professor Leons, who very much supported our topics when we worked at the Institute of System Analysis. He heard my report at the International Congress of Mathematicians and did very a lot of propagations. And, and due to him, I gave a lecture at Collège de France on for the best uh, mathematicians of France. Where this work. But now next. Uh, so, and in Berkeley, we worked mostly with uh, Praveen Varaya, Professor Varaya, and John Barris indicated to me that AGB equations can be used for solving estimation problems. We have also a joint paper with him. Next. And these are the people who did the toolboxes for boxes, for ellipsoids, and, and for the general case in Mitchell. They know each other all, did some things together. Go on. And these are the people who helped with this and participated, contributed to the calculations. Uh, Sasha Darin is the one who sits here. The other two are not in Milan now, but these are very young, uh, good people. Thank you. And the rest is what is written here. 
We are celebrating the 50th anniversary of IFAC, and there are many people, at least 20, 30 people, who were there. But now the medical system is better, so there will be much more people at the 100th anniversary of IFAC. Some of them are maybe here. So I wish you to successfully solve the oncoming problem. So knock, and it will be opened. Thank you. concludes our plenary uh, lecture this morning. I'd like to uh, warmly congratulate Professor Kozhansky on an excellent lecture. I could see that uh, you all were enjoying in particular the animations and I think the uh, slides that perhaps you enjoyed most were the ones of the traffic jams in Beijing, Los Angeles and Moscow. But I do think that uh, besides those very interesting control problems that uh, Professor Kruzhansky raised, that he, he covered a, a real rich breadth of material, and uh, we wish to thank him for that, and I'm sure he'll be very pleased to talk to you about the contents of his talk during the, uh, the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>